You always get the feeling when you get an introduction like that, the best thing you could do is sit where you are and not uh, do anything to um, knock yourself off a pedestal like that. Um, can I just start by saying I'm delighted to have the opportunity to be here and perhaps start on a, a sad note. It's uh, my first visit to Donegal since the tragic uh, accident last week and just to, uh, uh, as I did at the, at the time, just again to reiterate my sincere condolences to the families and the communities indeed that were so badly affected by that tragic uh, road accident. Um, can I also say that I'm fascinated listening to the, uh, my three co-panelists there and all the changes that they want to propose for the uh, political system and the political culture in this country. Um, talked about local government reform, reforming the interface between the public sector and, and citizens, reform of doll procedures, improved access to uh, official documents at all times, uh, the, improving the executive relationship with the, with the doll or with the legislature, and all of those wonderful things. And I just make one point, it ain't going to happen without electoral reform. The system is not capable of reform as it is at the moment. And all of those wonderful things that we can all subscribe to in theory will not happen when we continue to have the adversarial uh, political system that we have here. You've just got to love the current electoral system, particularly if you're a member of the Dáil. It elects people to do a very responsible job a very serious job, a job to shape this country and to make its laws for the benefit of all of its citizens. Nobody's addressed the fundamental reason why a doll is elected here in speaking uh, this afternoon, but that's why. And once elected, you get well paid to do that job. And the best part of it all for those that are elected is you don't really have to do it. And particularly, you don't have to do it if you're in opposition. But either side of the House, if you happen to be a minister, you, you certainly have a responsibility to do it. But even ministers can escape it as well. If, if, if you, like me, believe that the role of a member elected to the National Parliament is to try and hold a government, if you're not in government uh, as a minister, is to hold that government accountable, to scrutinise what the government are doing and saying, to ensure that government departments and state agencies do their job properly, spend the taxpayers' money wisely, and also you're elected to look after your individual constituents. But if, if you believe that, and you have to believe that, and a lot of people don't seem to believe that, but if you believe that, then I think it has to be said it's a fair thing to say that the, in the current system, the only thing that you have to do is a very, very small part of that job. That's look after your individual constituents. That's what you have to do if you want to get elected. And you can actually get away with that. You don't have to do any of the other things at all. And as I say, it's even better if you're in opposition. You can ignore the wider common good and the public interest and get elected again and again. You can follow opinion polls rather than show some kind of leadership. You'll get away with it and you'll probably get elected the next time round. You'll get into government probably the next time round. You can be the Mr. Angry if you want, jump on the latest bandwagon on every occasion and maybe just get a few of those extra votes in rural Ireland by sacrificing the poor old stag. And the same would apply no matter who was in opposition. If you're in opposition dying to get into government, then all you have to say is everything that the government is doing is wrong. It can be right probably a lot of the time. You can say on the one hand government is not spending enough, and on the other hand you can say that government is spending too much. It just depends on your audience at the time of day. Uh, you can say we shouldn't have paid our debts and met our obligations, but we should have gone to those same debtors and ask them to give us two billion or three billion or whatever it is to actually create jobs and to help us create jobs. We need the banks to start lending, but we should have let the whole banking system collapse. We should sack everybody that was in the banks at the time 
that the uh, recent crisis occurred. Get rid of them all. All at the same time, and at the same time then, we acknowledge the need for more experience in the banking system to ensure that we, we can get lending going for our struggling businesses. That's the nonsense that we've been hearing. And I'm not being party political in that. If the boot was on the other foot, we'd be at the same thing. Now, none of that's very good for anybody. And it can't be fixed. I accept it can't be fixed by changing the electoral system because it's what Joe wisely put in put down on this. It's a cultural issue. On the other hand, I believe that the political culture that I've described cannot be fixed without changing the electoral system. It cannot be fixed. Being answerable to the public, which is the catch cry of everybody that wants to leave the electoral system as it is, being answerable to the public is one thing, and it's a very important part of any electoral system. Being totally enslaved to a local electorate is something entirely different. And it's very unhealthy for a system supposed to serve the common good and the national interest. Not local interest, the national interest. So let's take a look at the, at the wider than the local. David referred to this earlier on. Let's look at what happened when all the new states emerged from the old communist regimes in Eastern Europe. Understandably, they wanted to install the very, very best systems for their citizens, all the systems that they wanted to put in place. So they went around and they had a look at the, at the various systems at various times. They didn't come to Ireland to learn anything about the electoral system, and none of them adopted it. One, I think, David corrected me previously, and quickly reversed out of that particular uh, system. And they were right. They were right to do that. The, right, the reality right now is that the major job in our system that any politician has, just when they get elected, the first thing he starts thinking about is how he's going to get re-elected. The next election starts the day of the count once you're elected. In essence, with very, very few exceptions, backbench government TDs and opposition TDs get re-elected by serving their needs of their constituents on an individual basis. That's, that's how it works. And many p p political people kind of shrug their shoulders at that particular statement and say, well, what's new? That's the way it's always been. And the answer is yes. That's the way it's always been. Does it matter? The answer to that question again is yes, it does matter. It matters very, very much. And I'm not suggesting, and this is one of the things that's often thrown out, I'm not suggesting that serving the needs of individual citizens is not part of the TD's job. Of course it is. Of course it's an important part of it. It's very important to represent individual clients. It's important to cut through the bureaucracy that's there on behalf of citizens that prevents them from getting the kind of services that they should get and deserve because the problems that David had about his number plate or whatever else. It is imp important that there is, uh, that TDs are there and that they do some of that. It's part of the job we're elected to do. But the more important part of that job is ensuring through the work that we do that the citizen works or the system works for every citizen, not just for the ones that are lucky enough to come to the individual TD or minister. The national good has to be served and that means that public representatives shouldn't be distracted from the national uh, function by constant clientelism. They should look after the individuals, but they should not be totally distracted, and that's the way it is. They become a hero, if you like, to one citizen through finding a way around the system that's there, when the real responsibility of a national parliamentarian is to change the system so that it benefits all citizens, to change it to ensure that you don't need a TD to write in for your housing, your medical card, or whatever else it might be. 
But if you know you'll get re-elected by returning every constituent's phone call, even if it deals with something that you well know that the local councillor should more properly do, then you'll return the call and you'll get enmeshed, enmeshed in that particular issue and you know that you're going to get elected because you're the, the go-to person, the person that can deliver. He can do it or she can do it. And as a result of all of that, many TDs get withdrawal symptoms if they have to be away from their mobile phone for 10 minutes. They go from one call to another. They live a very reactive, responsive life of service. And it, they believe that it gives them a special insight into their constituents' daily lives. And it does help them to do that. But the reality is that sooner or later, instead of them being public representatives, they end up as representatives of private individuals or lobby groups. And in theory and in practice, I believe that that is a bad thing. And in defining why it's a bad thing, I just want to quote, not the first time it's been quoted here, but uh, I think it, it, it does bear repeating again and again. Edmund Burke's great statement about the role of the public representative. Um, he first penned it about 400 years ago. It's a little bit remarkable, I think, that um, there's so few good quotes about uh, what a public representative sh uh, should do. But he says, I'm quoting, it ought to be the happiness and glory of a representative to live in the strictest union, the closest correspondence, the most unreserved communication with these constituents. That's what he says about it. That's good, and our system certainly leads to that. In fact, if Joel, forgive me, giving a plug for the Trim Swift Festival when Alistair Campbell was down, he was fascinated that we could get into the one room um, several po politicians, several people like uh, Noel Whelan, newspaper people, debating issues. He said it would never happen in, in England. He was fascinated at how close the political system was to the people here. But Burke went on and sa added to what he said, that the wishes of constituents ought to have great weight with the public representative but remain independent of every individual and every vested interest. And here's the way he put that. Your representative owes you not his own industry only, but his judgment. And he betrays instead of serving you if he sacrifices it to your opinion. And that's where our system is bad, because the intense inter-party and intra-party rivalry which, insists, or which exists in multi-seat constituencies. Sorry, you'd imagine I'd be able to say that word after all these years. <laughs> but in that kind of a system, positions are taken not on the merit of a cause, but on the basis of who shouts the loudest. So in other words, in, in any time that a public representative abandons their own judgment, to serve as the representative of a lobby group or an objective which they don't actually believe in, they're betraying their calling as a public representative. And I also say that if you spend so much time, and this was referred to by, I think, three, the, the three previous speakers, if you spend so much of your time on individual re representations that you haven't time to study, to research, to think about broader issues, then you are abandoning your own judgment and you're relying on the vested interests to inform you, to give you the line, to, to uh, get you to accept a particular line of thinking. I can't stress that half enough, nor can I state often enough that our cur current system, the system that we have, makes such betrayal inevitable because of the priority that we place on re-election. It was for that reason that when I was Minister for Local Government that I tried to separate the functions of TDs and councillors, tried to make uh, each a legitimate but not necessarily a conjoined career. 
try to get them separated. The art is politics, and David's point is right, and I think Noel made it as well. We do need a reformed local government system. An effective parliamentary system requires a good local government system as well. There's no question about that. And as I say, I believed that, that, that was the reform was the first step in all of that. In the 2007 general election campaign, I did an analysis of the uh, reps that we got on the canvas. Over 90% of them, about nearly 94% of the reps in the 2007 general election campaign were on local issues, local issues, as canvassers went round. And in the 2009 local election, over 90% of the queries and the statements that were made by people on the door were about national issues. So, of course, when we made the changes in the local government system, TDs were terrified that the relationship with individual constituents would shift to the local councillor. And uh, so the continued to, to do the things that we were trying to free them uh, from doing. It did lead that move to an increase in some very good work in summer octus committees, but that was about all the change it affected. Now, I'm not saying that our system is totally bad or anything else. It does have strengths, and they've been outlined by uh, some of the previous speakers. In particular, they give reasonably stable governments of fair proportionality. We tend to get that. But the most important thing, I believe, that should emerge from any electoral system is a government that's held to account by democratically elected politicians. We get that in name, but the reality, again, as you've heard from uh, fellow pan panelists, is government isn't really democratically held to account to the extent it should be in our modern society. Our state and semi-state organizations are not scrutinized nearly enough by our national politicians. When something is discovered, as we've seen in various incidents, then there's a lot of scrutiny. But things like that should not happen. Things like what happened in FOSS should not happen. And I, as I say, Noel Whelan has suggested a way where that could be prevented. Because the whole basis of what we do politically, and again largely because of the nature of our electoral system, is adversarial competition, there's very little opportunity for the collective approach to solving problems. And nowhere was that more uh, obvious than in the current economic situation, where the potential for collective action got overridden by the need of individ individuals and parties to score points and play to their specific audience. And again, that's not a party political. If the boot was on the other foot, we'd probably have got the same. Safe populism and cheap blame laying have their place, but good analysis of a situation and rigorous debate are of much, much more importance as far as I'm con concerned. And we tend to forget that because we don't have a parliamentary system within which the members can differentiate themselves by means of ideas rather than res uh, service response. Service response, as George Hook keeps reminding us every day on the telly, is what we expect from people who work in call centers for Sky TV. It's not what we should expect from our TDs. And that's complicated, as I said, by the multi-seat constituencies we have. Um, in that multi-seat constituency, not only do we have to be better than the opposition, we actually have to be one step ahead of our colleagues in, in the same party. We need to do away with a system of multi-seat constituencies. And we should look at some of the systems that David has, has uh, outla outlined here. We should look at them and see if we can come up with a system uh, that has a, a judicious use of a list to balance the skill sets, to make the TDs that are directly elected, uh, to, to, they will be answerable to the electorate, but so too would list TDs if you do it in a regional manner. Objectors say, and I've heard it again today, that the list system gives too, many, too much power to party headquarters, gives too much of a say. Now, 
does anyone seriously think that candidates can actually get through the selection procedures of the parties for the all elections at the moment if the par party hierarchy don't want them to? That's the reality. If, if you're party hierarchy that selects the candidates at the end of the day. To say those that are opposed, the list deputies will be less dependent. One of the reasons for not going down this route is that the list deputies will be less dependent on the lo local electorate and on the local organization for re-election and therefore will act more independently of the electorate. Yeah, that's true. I think that's good. Having at least half of the deputies in the Dáil less dependent on local interest groups, on local interest groups uh, for their re-election would allow them to take a broader view of proposals that are being brought forward by government. It would give them more time to scrutinise the actions of government, the actions of civil servants, public servants and state agencies. And it would also give them a little bit more time to do some of, the some of their own research and put forward proposals that will benefit all of the people rather than vested interests. Our system has some strengths, but it's in place 80 years without any significant change. We have to radically improve that system, our electoral system, our parliamentary system, our local government system, our public sector system. And we need within the electoral system to strike the balance and I am talking about striking the balance. I'm not talking about TDs not being answerable to a public, not having to look after uh, people's needs individually. A balance between that and the job uh, of as parliamentarians. Strangely enough, it may seem strange coming from a politician, but I believe that reform of the electoral system is too important to be left to the political system. We have to urgently set up the electoral commission that we're committed to in the programme for government, give them a task to present an objective assessment of our current system and alternatives to that particular system. And then we need real public debate on that, a debate moderated by that independent body, and at the end of that, that particular process, put a proposal to the electorate. In that process, we should seek to return Dáil Éireann to a central place in public thinking. It should be a battleground for ideas. It's not. It should be the location for intellectual debate. It's not. It should be the site where the brightest and best work in concert to try and achieve optimal results over the long term, not cheap point scoring in the short term. And as long as we refuse to even comp uh, contemplate let alone affect change to make our system work and our work more relevant to the day-to-day -day lives of our citizens. We're, we're doomed, I believe, to see continued decline in people's engagement with politics, with democracy and with our democratic system.